Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome, everyone, to this Peak Prosperity Podcast. It's June 22nd, 2017, and I'm your host, Chris Martinson. Well, today we've got a very special guest. We're going to be discussing the subject of societal collapse. At many prior points in human history, humans have constructed elaborate societies with a lot of complexity, only to see that complexity disappear. Perhaps one defining feature of every prior civilization is at their apex. None of them could foresee their own eventual demise. Each carried on as if it were the very pinnacle of achievement, certain to survive forever. Well, what's different about today's circumstances? What's the same as in the past? Are we facing collapse now, and how would we even know? Today we're talking with Joseph Tainter, known best among our listeners, perhaps, as the author of the book, The Collapse of Complex Societies. He studied anthropology at the University of California, Berkeley, and Northwestern University, where he received his PhD in 1975, and since 2012, he's held a professorship in the Department of Environment and Society at Utah State University. Dr. Tainter argues that sustainability or collapse of societies follow from the success or failure of problem-solving institutions, and that societies collapse when their investments in social complexity and their energy subsidies reach a point of diminishing marginal returns. That's what we're going to be talking about today, especially in regards to where culture is today, the risks it faces, and whether or not we might already be past the tipping point, but don't know that yet. Joseph, welcome to the program. Thank you. Well, I, I know many of my listeners are very eager to hear what you have to say. Let's start here by defining a term. Uh, when you speak of collapse, what do you mean by that? What I mean by collapse is a rapid simplification. Uh, collapse is a term that has many meanings. It has many colloquial meanings. I mean it in the sense of a society that exists at a level of complexity for a period of time, let's see, let's say at least several generations, and then it seems rapidly to simplify. Uh, a classic example would be the collapse of the Western Roman Empire in the 5th century AD, or another example would be the collapse of classic Maya civilization in the 9th century AD. These things happen fairly rapidly, uh, and that's why we apply the term collapse to these phenomena. All right, and so by simplification, I mean, we're talking about a society with, with many different uh, social niches, uh, specializations, and then suddenly those go away. Are we talking about uh, that, or is it the, the artifacts that they're capable of producing? What, what, what actually is simplifying in this story? Well, what, we, start, we have to start with what I mean by complexity, because, again, there are many usages of the term. Uh, I mean complexity to signify a society that has more parts, more different kinds of parts, more kinds of technologies, more kinds of social roles, uh, perhaps more hierarchical levels, uh, more institutions, uh, processes, more information, and so forth. Uh, as I've argued, these things tend to evolve uh, as a society addresses problems, and so they tend to accumulate over time. Collapse in a collapse, then these these characteristics, uh, the differentiation in structure and increasing organization and control, they rapidly disappear, uh, perhaps within a period of one to three generations or so. So a, coll a collapse has to be fairly rapid relative to the time period that a society has existed. Um, that's why collapses come as such a surprise to us. Why uh, why they're of perpetual historical interest because. Uh, we have so many examples of societies that uh, that are well known today. That they produced fill our museums. Uh, we write history books about them, and then suddenly they seem to disappear. Uh, so collapse has always been a mystery for this reason. Now I'm interested in this term complexity as well. Uh, having studied uh, complex systems and theory, and and we talk about it at at my website as well. Um, complex systems seem to require a couple of things uh, to maintain their order and, and their complexity, and one of them is energy. 
Um, and, and another feature of these complex systems is they're inherently unpredictable, at least scientifically, with a, a geologic fault line or even a pile of sand that's slowly accumulating. These complex systems uh, still yet defy our, our best efforts at, um, at really predicting when, what, and how they're going to evolve in the future. When you're talking about complexity, is it, is it a separate term? from complex systems? Well, complexity makes up complex systems. Our complex systems are made up of, of, of complexity. The, the terms, I use them essentially interchangeably. Um, com complexity in my concept, and this is from my study of the evolution of human societies, consists of two aspects. One is what I call, uh, forgive the technical term, differentiation in structure. What that means is that as, as human societies evolved over time, they come to have more parts, more kinds of parts. Uh, as I just said, more kinds of technologies, more kinds of institutions, more kinds of social roles, and so forth. So the society comes to have more and more kinds of parts. The second aspect of complexity is organization, uh, because the parts have to be organized together to make a system or to make a society. So in my conception, uh, complexity consists of structure and organization. Okay, so let's talk about when complexity began to arise. I, I assume that as we came out of uh, hunter-gatherer uh, cultures, and there were lots of them all over the place, each with their own um, very sophisticated sort of adaptations to their local environment, different cultural mores and practices and, and things like that. But at some point, uh, uh, humans banded together and began to, to uh, go down this complexity route. What was the, what was the trigger for that? Well, the trigger is always that complexity increases to solve problems. Now, before the development of agriculture, people largely solved their problems by moving. Uh, they moved about the landscape in search of the resources that they needed, and they usually had a fairly well-established seasonal round uh, where they would go to different resource zones at different seasons and, and obtain what they needed to live. And, and you can still see this in the few hunter-gatherer people who live today, like the son of, of the Kalahari in Botswana. Um, at some point toward the end of the last ice age, it appears that human populations were increasing, and the option to move around the landscape was being lost. That, In other words, the landscape was becoming populated with more and more people. Uh, and so people shifted to reliance more and more on agriculture. And reliance on agriculture seems to be one of the triggers that generates further increase in complexity. Because to be agriculturalists, people had to be sedentary. They had to live in more or less the same place every year uh, and year round in order to tend their crops. Uh, and being sedentary means that they had to live in uh, larger communities. And when you live in larger communities, you have disputes between individuals, you have to have rules, you have to have ways of solving disputes. Uh, you tend to get people who specialize in certain kinds of things and maybe people who specialize, say, in making pottery or making stone tools or making metal tools. Other people specialize in producing food as farmers. So you get, you get markets emerging uh, and complex economic exchange systems. And so once you have agriculture and sedentary communities that grow in size, then complexity in human society seem to grow. And that's been the story for much of, of the Earth over the, about the last 12,000 years. And, and food, of course, agriculture producing a, a reliable surplus of food, um, well, reasonably reliable, depending on the year we're talking about. Uh, and then that's our, the energy source. So, so we, at, with a reliable source of energy, complexity seems to be able to emerge as an emergent property of that. Um, but let's talk about this complexity and, and, and problem solving. It's, it's a coin with two sides. And so clearly, um, complexity has uh, clear advantages. I want to talk about that first. But I think your work surfaces. It has, uh, beyond a point in particular, it has disadvantages. Let's start with the advantages. What, is, what does complexity really get us? Well, just, just think of how we solve problems. Um, Think example of how we're addressing the problem of, of pollution and declining supplies of fossil fuels. One of the solutions seems to be hybrid automobiles. Um, it used to be that uh, an automobile needed only one means of propulsion, and now they seem to need two. Um, so the system has become more complex. Uh, it has differentiated structure. It now has two means of propulsion rather than one. And there's now software uh, and electronics to integrate the two parts together. 
um, so that the system is also more organized. Or you could think of how we respond to uh, the threat of terrorism. Um, after September 11, 2001, think of how the United States and, and also the European countries responded to the problem of terrorism. Uh, we developed more bureaucratic institutions, the Department of Homeland Security, Transportation Security Administration. So we've differentiated structure. And at the same time, we've increased organization, meaning that we have tried to increase control over behaviors that we consider threatening. Uh, so, this, so what we see in, in, in these two examples is increasing complexity to solve problems. Uh, the challenge of this uh, is that complexity isn't free. Uh, it is a basic fundamental of thermodynamics that a more complex system takes energy. And so as societies over the last 12,000 years grew more complex, they needed more energy to sustain their complexity. Um, at first, this came from intensifying agricultural production. And then over the last 200 years, it's come primarily from fossil fuels. So this increase in complexity is uh, it, it clearly it's, it's providing some benefits up to a point. It has a tipping point where uh, the complexity has, a, has an energetic, a metabolic cost to it that uh, begins to exceed potentially uh, the benefits that you're getting from that. Is that a fair way to put it? Well, what I, I wouldn't say that it exceeds the benefits, but, ult but ultimately, given enough time and given enough growing complexity, uh, investment in complexity reaches the point of diminishing returns. We develop the simplest and, and least expensive solutions first. So human societies have grown from simple and small to large and complex. Um, our technologies have grown from fairly simple to highly complex today. Uh, if you think about the amounts of information we process, um, information has gone from word of mouth to the information technology that we have today. Uh, you can see that we tend to adopt the simplest and most cost-effective solutions first. And when those no longer suffice, then we go to more expensive solutions. Um, but they tend to reach the point of diminishing returns so that it costs more and more to solve our problems over time. And what I see in the historical record, cases like the Roman Empire and the Maya, uh, is that when a society reaches this point of diminishing returns, it starts to become vulnerable to collapse. Uh, collapse doesn't necessarily happen right away, uh, but the society becomes vulnerable. Well, let's talk about that uh, vulnerability in, in today's world. Uh, let, let's, um, uh, let me see how I focus this down. So, you know, as um, our work at Peak Prosperity, it's encapsulated in this body of work uh, known as the crash course, and, and that connects our current economic model to resources, especially energy, and, and particularly oil. Uh, in brief, our work notes an economic model that's based on perpetual exponential expansion, um, it, it, that model has a lot of proponents who are rather feverishly ignoring the idea of limits of any sort, uh, but particularly energy limits. And uh, to you know, make this really specific, uh, in food production, food production is now and has been for a number of decades now a net energy losing proposition to the tune of 10 to 1. That's a minimum estimate. Some estimates go as high as almost 20 calories of fossil fuels embedded in each calorie that you or I eat. Uh, and, and that's an almost perfect inversion of the historical role of food as an energy source, not a sink. So we're literally eating fossil fuels in this regard. Um, those, by every model I've studied, peak and begin to wane, not instantly, but it's a long, slow decline into, into, the, into the distance. Um, right about the time human population crests, somewhere between 8 and 10 billion souls. This to me and to the people who, who follow um, my work and, and the work of others like the, what the Meadows did and, and uh, other people who simply note limits. Um, this seems to us to be a very obvious conundrum that we're facing beyond a problem, even potentially a predicament because uh, we don't have that plan B in this case. Um, is what the, the question I'm trying to get to here is, is this seems like a really obvious thing to me, and yet there's almost no public traction or certainly no policy traction around this idea. Instead, all of our eggs seem to be in the basket of, well, we'll invent something. Elon Musk will be really clever. If necessary, we'll all move to Mars or something will happen. That, that, that to me feels like a, a self-delusional uh, arrangement in this particular case. 
And uh, I'm just wondering, is that a, a common sort of a feature that happens when, when societies reach their maximum complexity? Are there, you know, are there the Cassandras out there, as it were, who are able to note the data, bring it forward? And um, are there, do you have examples of where societies have successfully navigated what the data was telling them rather than where their cultural inertia was taking them? There are two aspects to, to the issue that you raised. One is that sustainability requires that people have the ability and the inclination to think broadly in terms of time and space. In other words, to think broadly in a geographical sense about the world around them and the world as a whole mm -hmm. and the state of the world as a whole, and also to think broadly in time uh, in terms of the near and, and distant future and what uh, resources will be available to our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. The problem, one of the major problems in sustainability and in this whole question of resources and collapse is that we did not evolve as a species to have this ability to think broadly in time and space. Uh, instead, our ancestors, who lived as hunter-gatherers, um, never confronted any challenges that required them to think beyond their locality and the near term. And so our species never evolved an inclination to think broadly in time and space. And so this is one of the major challenges in sustainability, and I think it explains the problem you bring up of people not being aware or not paying attention to the kinds of resource issues that you and your team are studying. Uh, the second problem that which you alluded to is that uh, technological optimists argue that, um, that we don't really need to worry about resources that all we need are free markets and the price mechanism, that as long as there are um, free markets, that whenever a resource starts to become scarce, uh, the market signals that it's time to innovate, that there will be rewards to innovation. And so the assumption is that as a resource becomes scarce, uh, people develop, uh, put effort into developing a new resource or finding more efficient ways of using the existing resource or developing new technologies and so forth. Uh, this is a hard argument to counter because up until this point, the technological, the te excuse me, the technological optimists have been correct. Uh, we have maintained the most complex society humanity has ever, has ever known, and we have maintained it up to this point. And this is a question that has interested me for some time. Um, I have argued that, that in a, Technological innovation and other kinds of innovation evolve like any other aspect of complexity. Um, they that that the investments in research and development grow increasingly complex and reach diminishing returns. What what this means is that uh, in the 19th century, for example, um, science advanced by uh, the work of what are called the lone wolf naturalists, like Charles Darwin or Gregor Mendel or Murray. Today, research is done by large interdisciplinary teams who work in big, expensive institutions. Uh, it's a major activity. It's very expensive. And I argue that it has reached the point of diminishing returns. Well, a number of years ago, a few years ago, I teamed up with a couple of economists who actually had a data set that allowed us to test this. Uh, my colleagues are Deborah Stromsky and Jose Lobo, who are both at Arizona State University. And they had a database of over 11 million patents extending back to about 1974. And so we tried to measure the productivity of research using this database, uh, and our measure is patents per inventor. What we found is that over the last 30, 35, 40 years, uh, it has taken more and more inventors to achieve a patentable innovation. And at the same time, uh, the number of patents per author is going down. What this means is that the cost of innovation is going up um, and, and the returns are diminishing. We are reaching the point of diminishing returns to our investments in innovation. Now, you can't tell this um, from today's market because there are always new electronic products coming along. But in fact, this has implications over the long term because this can't continue forever. We cannot forever continue to spend more and more um, on technological innovation when we've reached the point of diminishing returns, which I argue we have reached. Uh, and so uh, one of the things I suggest is that our system of innovation is going to change very significantly over the next 20 to 30 to 50 years or so. 
by the end of this century, our system of innovation will not be anything like what we know today. It will have to be very different. And it's likely that innovation is not going to be able to solve our problems as readily as it has done to this point. So this is my to the technological optimists. Uh, what they have, they have assumed that the productivity of innovation is either constant or increasing. And in fact, what I think my colleagues and I can show is that the productivity of innovation is actually decreasing. And what that means is that we will not forever be able to solve resource problems through innovation. Well, uh, I'm glad to hear you say that because, you know, I, I do study the resource side. And, and so when we look at what's really happening there, we, we see some very interesting um, and troubling signs. So, for instance, I, I think uh, uh, whatever we're doing agriculturally, it, it's become very cost efficient and people are very happy with, with the cheapness of food. I believe that uh, food costs now are, are at their pretty much human historical um, most inexpensive ever. And that's a wonderful thing, but if you wander over into the ecological side, you'll discover that insect populations have collapsed by upwards of 40% in the last couple decades across Europe and the United States, possibly other places, but that's where they've been studied. And we're missing things like whippoorwills and, and all the associated chain species going up and up. And um, uh, But that, that, that innovation, whatever sets of innovations that we've unleashed to create cheap food have had these... Uh, other effects that that I believe are uh, heavily overlooked and uh, and going to be creating vast difficulties for us in the future. Because here's the one thing I know about complex systems: you can't predict them, and uh, they have this thing called unintended consequences that just uh, will come through and and change change things for you. So. Um, you know, with that, you know, th that's the kind of data that I will point to to some of the technological optimists to say whatever we're doing technologically, it's giving us these results too. Um, and we're discounting those because they haven't bitten us yet. But it feels, and um, my PhD is in a biological science, so I focus on the biology side of the story. To me, it feels pretty obvious that we can't just continue to um, uh, alter ecological systems at the pace that we're altering them without experiencing uh, some rather unfortunate uh, knock-on effects coming down the line. But getting that conversation, connecting those two dots, not easy. I, I agree with you completely. I think your analysis is correct. And the emphasis that I put on it as a social scientist is how do we cope with the alterations that we're making in ecological systems? Um, how, do, how do we make up for the alterations we're conducting to, to ecological systems? Uh, I, I did a book with a couple of ecologists called Supply Side Sustainability in which we argued that, uh, that natural resource management basically consists of substituting human activities for things that nature formerly provided. Uh, and of course, anytime we subsidize nature by our own activities, it's very costly. Uh, and the cost is ultimately comes down to energy. So this comes back to, this always comes back to the question of how long are we going to be able to rely on fossil fuels uh, to subsidize our way of life? Well, uh, to me, that's that you can model that because uh, we, we have a pretty good sense of uh, how much coal, how much natural gas, how much oil is in the ground. And uh, what it's going to cost to get it out. And this gets us to what I think is probably the most unappreciated and most important point in energy studies, which is that we don't live on the aggregate energy. You and I live on the surplus energy, the net energy delivered. And so this is something that I spend most of my time when I do go give a talk, if I'm talking in front of a room full of financial people, say at a, at a wealth conference, I'll just connect energy and the economy for them. That's, if I can only connect two dots, that's what I'll do. And on the energy side, it's really letting them know that when we first drilled into Spindletop or when we first tucked into the Gawar field in Saudi Arabia, drilling down 1,000 feet and having wells that would produce 3, 4, 5, 10,000 barrels a day for decades is a very different proposition from drilling into the Bakken in North Dakota, down 10,000 feet, sideways for another 10,000 feet, 100-stage frack, 50 million pounds of sand, to open up a well that will yield 500 barrels for the first month and then decline 85% in three years, wash, rinse, repeat, do that as fast as you can, and you can maintain the appearance of aggregate amounts of oil coming out into the world. But what you're missing is that the net energy involved in um, you know, the, the first drill sets I talked about compared to the second are entirely different propositions. And of course, society lives on the net energy. We're happy that the oil people are busy drilling, doing what they're doing, but 
If they're only giving us five barrels back for every barrel of energy they use instead of 100 barrels back, we have to figure out how to live on five instead of 100, and that's a very different proposition. That's what's happening as I look into the energy space right now, is a declining net energy profile coming out of the, our, our oil exploration in particular, and you combine that with population metrics and you have declining net energy per capita. This gives me the willies, should it? Oh, it definitely should. Your analysis is correct. This is what's called, as, as you know, energy return on investment. Uh, for example, 1940, the United States produced oil and gas at, at an energy return on investment of 100 to 1. Uh, for every barrel of oil we would invest in finding and producing oil, we got 100 back. This is how we fought World War II, is that we had this enormous of, of high net yield energy, and we provided not only all of our own um, petroleum for World War II, but most, but that, that most of our has used as well. Um, so that was 100 to 1 in 1940. Uh, the energy return on investment, we use the term EROI, now in the United States is down to 15 to 1. And the trend is irreversible. It will simply continue to go down. You cannot reverse the trend because we first exploit what are called the elephants, the big shallow pools that are on shore. And as we deplete those, we go to pools of oil that are what I call um, deep, dark, cold, remote, and dangerous, um, and that require more complex technologies uh, to get, find the oil and to produce it and, and, and get it to the consumer. And this increases costliness and gets us back to the problem of increasing complexity. Uh, and in this case, increasing complexity uh, in the technology to find and produce oil uh, leads to the problem of, of declining EROI, declining net energy. And so net energy per capita, I, I assume that, um, well, have, first, have this, has that uh, metric been tracked across any of the uh, collapsed societies that you studied? No, because we, we don't have much data on, um, on, on, on the productivity of ancient societies. They didn't keep records like we do. What we can see is some of the indirect effects. For example, in the Roman Empire, we know that during the 4th century AD, as the, the Roman Empire grew more complex, primarily in the 3rd century, to confront problems that it faced. Uh, it, it faced invasions from Germanic people from the north and the Persians from the east, uh, and there was a period of just almost unremitting civil wars. And, and during the period, a 50-year period in the 3rd century, there was something like 50 different emperors or or would-be emperors, uh, and at one time the Roman Empire actually broke up into three pieces and it looked like it was it was about done. It was going to go away at that time. But they reorganized themselves, they increased the size of the army, they increased the size and complexity of the government, and it worked. They survived. Uh, it was what I call an early, an early exercise in sustainability. They sustained their way of life, the Greco-Roman civilization, and they sustained the empire. The problem that they had to increase taxes on the peasantry to pay for this. So we know that taxes doubled and then doubled again during the course of the 4th century AD, and we, we see some of the consequences of this. Peasants abandoned their lands, peasants weren't able to pay taxes, sometimes and there, even, there are even horrible stories of peasants having to sell their own children into slavery because they couldn't afford to feed them. So for ancient societies, we can, we can see some of the indirect effects of increasing costliness of complexity. Uh, we see this also in the Maya civilization, where uh, at, at a Maya city like Tikal, we can see in, in the human remains themselves and the skeletons of people who, were buried, who died and were buried there, we can see that over time, there's, uh, there's, nutrition seems to get worse and worse. Um, stature declined, meaning people... Uh, became shorter over time. Uh, we see more and more indicators of disease in the skeletons, um, and, and it's another indirect indicator of how the costliness of being a complex society was uh, really undermining the support base, the support population, which was the peasants. I, I think a, 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 a an analogy for that that I've got here is that um, we do we do have some pretty good data and we can track net energy per capita. Well, you're noting those very high EROI returns uh, in the United States up through the 40s. Um, they actually peaked out about in the early 19 mid 1970s, and just coincidentally or not, that was the time uh, when we experienced a steady erosion of a single 
earner, particularly a minimum wage earner, to support anything that remotely looks like a household. And today, of course, you know, even uh, two minimum wage earners can't support a, an average household in an average city. So um, uh, just coincidentally or not, but there's very nice alignment in the data that says when our um, net energy per capita started to wane, so did what we call the, the poor and the, and the lower classes, the middle classes. We're starting to see that erosion of, it's just becoming more and more difficult. It starts to work its way up the chain, and there are a lot of other factors, of course, monetary policy, tax policy, things we could throw in. But to me, you know, one thing that you might predict just from the outside without knowing a lot of the other variables would be to say that as net energy per capita begins to decline, you're going to start to notice that in the erosion of the social structures, particularly at the bottom. Would that be possibly a fair sort of a hypothesis to throw out there? Oh, I, I, I think that is a fair hypothesis to throw out, and, and it is something that people need to learn about. Um, since World War II, every recession has come about following a major spike in the price of oil. Uh, even in 2008, you could see, you know, we attribute that recession to the housing crisis, but 2008 was also the peak in oil prices, um, and there was also peak usage in several other commodities, primarily because of all the construction going on in China. Um, so you can, you can clearly see how this affects people's lives, and it is affecting people's lives already, and it will continue to do so increasingly in the future. Indeed, that when we had that spike in uh, July of 2008 for oil, uh, we saw the same difficulties in Europe and the so-called pigs, which is uh, Portugal, Ireland, Italy, uh, Greece, and Spain. Uh, if you look at those who had the most trouble, um, they were they were all 100% oil importers. Uh, so there was Greece struggling along with a sh somewhat shoddy economy and, and some maybe fraudulent accounting, importing 100% of its oil. So that model broke apart for them, and the same across the rest of the so-called pigs. So so um, what we're really talking about then is the collapse. This idea of collapse, which is a sudden simplification and sudden defined in terms of generations potentially. Uh, Collapse in is really, it's driven, it's an economic description, something we're describing economically. And I'm going to note here that an economy is, is merely the coordinated movement of energy flows. Uh, we might call these goods and services, but each of those is dependent on energy. So if I have no food and I'm out of personal energy, I'm not going to be taking your dogs for a walk. The dog walking service economy is itself then as a derivative of me being well fed in the first place hey, food we know is a derivative of other highly structured energy flows, principally fossil fuels. So um, in this story, it feels like understanding and having uh, a really grounded sense of, of the energy um, flows in an economy is really important. Uh, as you look about in the United States today, what, what would you make of the uh, energy policies as you see them? Well, I, I think I was quite concerned about 2008 when um, – you know, Eroy was declining. The price of energy was was just skyrocketing, and and I was very concerned that that if that trend continued, that that within 20 to 30 years we might be facing a collapse in in the industrial societies. Um, I think now that hydraulic fracturing has given us a reprieve. Uh, it has given us, you know, of course the you know, oil is abundant now uh, and the price is low, but those are temporary conditions. Um, you know, in the hydraulic fracturing fields, they're of course doing what resource um, what resource obtainers always do. They're going for the best deposits first, and so um, you know the less desirable deposits are the ones that we're going to be using in the future. Um, but but at the moment, energy is inexpensive enough that I think this has given us an opportunity to rationally plan a transition to renewable energy sources. Not that renewable energy sources don't have their own problems, but if we want to maintain our way of a way of life, the way of life we've achieved, uh, and and there are many aspects of it that are worth retaining, uh, we have to try to maintain something like the energy per capita that we enjoy today. Uh, in some places that can be done with renewables; in other places it can't be done. But what I'm suggesting is that is that uh, hydraulic fracturing has given us a reprieve, uh, and it's up to us to take advantage of that reprieve. And uh, I would agree. And and uh, it, uh, when I talk with some people in the energy business, they're they're just ashen faced that one of the things we're choosing to do with all the natural gas we're pulling out is put it into um, turbines and burn it for electricity because it's it's uh, that's a bad use for an, an amazing fuel source. 
um, and uh, and we're doing that because it makes economic sense. Now, a lot of the analysis too complex for this moment, but a lot of the reason we're continuing to fracture hydraulically fracture at the pace we are is because of extremely liberal financial conditions that exist right now, um, courtesy of of the Federal Reserve and other central banks. So if we can talk about the problems, even predicaments we face today to get into this part of it, um, in a world debt levels have never been higher in aggregate terms. And policymakers are, air quote time here, solving today's problems really by saving them up for tomorrow. So so what we've really done is, is just massively increased the amount of debt, really eased the financial conditions, flooded the markets with liquidity. Uh, the central banks, I think, were hoping that growth would come um, roaring along. And it hasn't, Joseph. We're like 10 years into this low growth experiment right now. I think you can understand it with declining EROI in part. I think you can just uh, understand it the rest of the way with high debt levels. Neither of those um, analyses really are, are what I'll say current <laughs> for, for the current policymakers. But this idea of financially kicking the can down the road, this is, this is an old story, isn't it? Oh, oh, it certainly is. And uh, the, the, the debt levels concern me very much. Basically, we are solving today's problems by taxing the future. Uh, that's what we're doing by taking on debt. Uh, the Romans did something like this uh, back in the first through third centuries AD, where they were faced with costs of maintaining the Roman Empire that they couldn't afford. Uh, they, they, had a, they issued a primary silver coin called the denarius. Uh, it starts out in the first century AD, 98 to 99% pure silver. Uh, and as the Rome, as the expenses of being the Roman government grew, uh, what they had to do was debase the currency by progressively adding more and more copper into it. Uh, so by the time you get to about the year 270 AD, it's down to about 2% silver. Um, and and this was another so, so that the, the currency came to have less and less intrinsic value. Um, and this generated inflation then two or three generations later. So it was another example of how a government solved its current problems by shifting the costs onto the future. Uh, and governments do this every chance they get. That, <clears throat> that inflation showed up two or three generations later? Yeah, yeah. You see, you, see, you see it primarily during the course of the third and fourth centuries. Wow, what a, what a time delay. Uh, that's interesting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, in, one of the things that, that uh, I argue is that if you, like in Weimar Germany, if you print money and throw it straight into the economy, you can see you, you destroy your purchasing power temporarily, right right in the moment. Um, but if, yeah. you, if you issue debt that isn't, doesn't have to be basically paid for five or ten years, you, you're still destroying purchasing power, but you're doing it then, not now. That provides enough of a gap. Um, for humans to not really notice and uh, and get us back to that, I think, uh, famous Keynes quote that not one man in a million can diagnose the actual cause of inflation uh, because it's been it happened it, it like the inflation I think we're going to experience in the future uh, happened about five years ago um, and, and yes. through yeah. current. So given all of this, it, it, knowing what you know, if we were going to um, not go through a collapse because I agree there's so much worth preserving here and so much that that I would love to not lose what would we be doing uh, now as a culture as a, as a species if we were going to um, take note of our current environment and really begin to uh, operate according to uh, what you've discovered well I, I applaud the work that you're doing I think people like you and me and the others who work on limits need to continue trying to educate the public but I also think that individuals need to take responsibility for their own ignorance. Um, as I said, our species did not evolve to think broadly in terms of time and space. And if we're going to maintain our way of life, people have to learn to do so. Uh, people have to take responsibility for knowing and understanding uh, the predicament that we're facing. Uh, and, and I have argued in over the last few years that we need to start teaching early school age children in, in K to 12 to think differently, to think broadly in terms of time and space, to think, to think historically, to think long term about the future, to think broadly about what's going on in the world around us, instead of the narrow way, uh, the narrow local way that most people live and, and, and think. Uh, so I, I, I put responsibility on individuals to broaden their knowledge. So broaden their knowledge is as part one, and um, if they did broaden yes, their knowledge, that's part one. That's part one, and then um, changes would hopefully follow from that. I mean, we we have to understand that our economies can't grow forever. <laughs>
<laughs> from from your lips to everybody's ears, hopefully, uh, because and that just seems so patently obvious. I think to anybody who, who takes the time to study it, it just it's not even a, a light bulb moment. It's more of a forehead slapping moment. You go, oh well, how did I miss that? And we miss that because our cultural narratives are are really robust in convincing us that that's not something that we're going to be talking about or thinking about. Um, and and so uh, I agree. You know, step one has to be the education, and there is no there is no excuse for ignorance anymore. If I if I waved my cell phone about, you know, this is a device that allows me to access all the information of humanity, basically. So it's all there. Uh, but then, it, yeah, it has to lead to uh, actions and coordinated actions, and that's what we're about in our organization is learn but then do and the doing in many cases is learning how to how to live with less um, just as fine you, we notice that energy per capita in Europe is half that of the United States they live fine uh, so there are lots of things we can do and so uh, Joseph this is you know where my both my hope and frustration comes in this story is that I don't think we need new technology I think we've got plenty of technologies that are just sitting there that work perfectly well like solar thermal heaters using the sun to heat hot water. Some countries have mandated it because it makes so much sense. You know, but here in the United States, it's a very rare thing to even see uh, one of those uh, uh, devices in the average city I visit. So that idea of, of um, uh, what is it that, that you know about that we can do to begin to change our cultural programming, if I can call it that, but there's, it feels like our narratives, like the stories we're living by are not aligned with the reality as we see it today if we study it so how do we go about realigning cultural narratives with the data it, it can't be done in the short term uh, as, I, as i just mentioned the emphasis i place is really childhood education that's where we have to start so that perhaps in a generation we have a populace that is more aware um, that is more cognizant that's more responsible and that knows that we have some difficult choices to make hmm. Well, with that, thank you very much for your time today. We've been talking with Dr. Joseph Tainter and uh, just a fabulous interview. Doing, you're doing fabulous work, uh, Dr. Tainter. Is there anything that uh, you could direct our listeners to about do you have another book coming out or speeches coming up or a, a way to follow your work? There is a book that I wrote. It's, it's a, a, a mass market book. It's written for a mass audience uh, called Drilling Down. It was a book that I wrote with a petroleum engineer in response to the, the, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Um, the opportunity to write uh, my chapters about the role of energy in society and basically about a lot of the things we were talking about today. Well, fantastic. So the, 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 the title is Drilling Down, and it's an inexpensive paperback. Drilling Down. Well, I'll certainly I'll be directing people to that. We'll put a link to it at the bottom of this podcast. So with that, uh, Joseph, thank you so much for your time today. My pleasure.